Good evening and welcome to the second NBC 5's primetime debate ahead of the general election. I'm Ellis King, joined by anchors Brian Colloran and Stuart Ledbetter. With us tonight, the major party nominees for governor of Vermont this year. The Republican and incumbent governor Phil Scott of Berlin, who is seeking a fourth term. And his Democratic challenger, Brenda Siegel of Newfane. She's a housing and policy advocate who uh, won the August primary unopposed. Before we get started, let's go over the rules. Each candidate has one minute for an opening statement. We're going to ask general questions of each of you, <laughs> later direct questions of only one of you, and then our lightning round with a minute at the end for your closing remarks. So let's begin. Governor Scott, your opening statement, please. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, I know there's a lot of competing interests. We have football, we have the Yankees, and uh, we have Taylor Swift apparently as well. So. I think tonight uh, you should pay attention uh, to the promises made, uh, but also as to what those promises will cost, because there is a price to pay. There's no doubt that we have challenges uh, that have been historic. I remember 631. I talked about this uh, six years ago. We we're losing six workers out of our workforce every single day. We we're losing three students out of our schools every single day. Um, and they're still with us. We made some, some gains uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but they're still challenges nonetheless. But we have opportunities as well. We have ARPA money uh, that we need to invest. I wanna make sure that we see that through. And, uh, and that's why I decided to run again, uh, because we can change the trajectory in, in Vermont and we can have transformative changes and we'll be much better off in the future. So I look forward to your votes. Ms. Siegel. Your opening statement, please. Last year on October 14th, I stood on the State House steps and said that I would not leave until the governor fully reinstated the program that emergency housed people experiencing homelessness. I did not know that I would be there for 27 nights and 28 days, and despite my empathy on the issue, I was vastly unprepared for how quickly my body and mind would begin to decline. There were many people most, I would say, that thought that we could not win, but on that last day, we won. What I know is that the housing crisis did not begin with COVID. It's been barreling at us for a long time, and we need leadership on that issue. COVID was a crisis that we all experienced, but it was not the first crisis or the only crisis, and we need leadership on all those issues. And what I've learned in my life is that we can have housing for all Vermonters, that we can heal the overdose crisis, and that we can meet our climate goals. This is the work that I have done at the state federal, and federal level and alongside our administrators and what I will continue to do as governor. Thank you all for having me and thank you Vermonters for all the work that you do to make Vermont the state that we all love so much. Thank you both. Now, uh, general questions. Uh, we'll give, begin with you, Ms. Siegel. There may be no greater issue uh, challenging our state economy than the shortage of housing. It's only gotten worse during the pandemic. It's trapped a lot of renters who would like to buy, prevented others who'd like to move here for a job. Beyond the funding that has already been approved by the legislature the last couple of years, what is it going to take to significantly speed up new housing that working Vermonters can afford? Well, we have to make a strategic plan that addresses both short-term, transitional, and permanent housing for everyone from people with low incomes and people experiencing homelessness all the way to upper middle income folks. Because no matter who you are in this state, it is a challenge to be mobile at all, to have jobs, to, to be able to move in for different jobs. And so the work that we have to do right now, when we are spending $1.5 billion in 10 years to, to keep people unhoused, is to make sure we make the investments to have a stronger future for all Vermonters. Mr. Scott. Well, the good news is we do have a strategic plan and we're implementing that. Uh, over the last uh, two years, since 2020, we've actually invested uh, almost a half a billion dollars in housing with our partners, uh, VHCB, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, with their partners, all the housing trusts, uh, Champlain, uh, trusts and all of the other housing uh, advocates and nonprofits that are working with them. Uh, we're working uh, with VFHA uh, as well. Uh, so we, uh, it takes a while uh, to get through the process. It takes a while to uh, permit 
uh, as well as to design and then uh, actually build uh, the units that we need to build. But we put 2,000 online as a result of the $37 million housing bond that was historic back in 2016. Uh, if you remember then, that leveraged another uh, $200 million. It was the largest, single largest investment in housing Vermont has ever seen. And uh, again, about 2,000 units have been put online since then, and we'll have thousands more in the years to come. So you can't flip a switch and make it, make it so. It takes time in Vermont with all the permitting, the design, the construction, and so forth to put this online. Ms. Siegel, you want to rebut? Yes. It can't just be about making investments. There has to be an actual plan that meets the need. We can't just have uh, money go to new builds, but right now people are not housed across the state. Right now, when we bring in new workers, they end up leaving because we don't have housing for them. And so we need a short-term strategic plan to address the need now and know that we're going to meet the need in five and ten years from now as well. Again, good news is that strategic plan is in place. Uh, it was put together with a $37 million housing bond uh, back uh, four years ago. Uh, it was ignored for years, decades, uh, with, with the legislature. Everyone was talking about how do we put more housing uh, together. We all agreed there needed to be more housing, but nobody would make the first move until I came into office. And we did that. Big step. Single largest investment in housing Vermont has ever seen. Uh, putting 2,000 units in li in, on line right now. Uh, as well with the other 400 million uh, that we're going to be implementing over the next few years. That's a big deal. Next question. What changes will you push the legislature to make with Vermont's development law, Act 250, to speed up construction? Or is Act 250 not the problem? Mr. Scott? Well, Act 250 is part of the problem, and it needs to be modernized. It's 50-year-old law. And uh, we had uh, a number of uh, steps forward with that. We had a lot of suggestions. We had buy-in from some of the environmental groups. Unfortunately, uh, the legislature didn't follow through. Uh, they changed it substantially and made it worse. Uh, so we had to veto that bill last year. Um, but, uh, but that's not the only problem. We need zoning upgrades, zoning regulation upgrades, as well as uh, ANR um, and state permits. Uh, and as well as federal permits, and they all have to align. It shouldn't be duplication. It should be simplified, and we should have a fast track uh, that we can implement housing uh, for all. Uh, so we, uh, we're working on that. Again, is no simple solution, but Act 250 definitely needs to be reformed. Ms. Siegel. The first thing we have to do is fully staff the Act 250 ha office. For many years now, the Act 250 office has been intentionally under-staffed, which makes it not work as well as it could have otherwise. Also, the bill that the legislature put forward created forest blocks, which protected our environment, and also made, did a better job of building our city, bringing our city centers. It was going to be a small change to move towards the path to reforming Act 250, and it's what we need to do right now if we want to make these important changes. But it isn't the only thing. We also have to make sure that we're bringing online and not just new housing, but that we're bringing down in pods and expandable housing and storage so that we can make sure people are getting what they need right now in Vermont so they have somewhere to live today. Because today, no matter what plan has been put in place, we still haven't addressed how, pe how people live here now, how we build our workforce now. Well, that kind of leads us to our next question. Ms. Siegel, uh, you've championed expansion of resources for homeless Vermonters. Thanks to federal money, Vermont housed a record number of people in motel rooms during the pandemic at great expense. But that money, as we know, is r running out. It's ending. Now Burlington is opening a pilot project. Take a look at this picture. Individual housing pods for folks experiencing homelessness to live in. Uh, what do you think of this approach, and would it work around the state? Uh, Ms. Siegel, let's start with you. One of the concerns that I have is that we didn't come up with a strong transitional plan. We have been spending per family um, it, in the excess sometimes of $5,000 a month on these hotels. We had two and a half years to come up with another plan. And part of that should have been these pods being built around the state, using pallet housing around the state, and there's also new expandable housing that we could be building much more quickly. And 
that it shouldn't be just a pilot program because this winter we're not only going to have the 3,000 people, some of which are in transitional housing now, but not all, but also 8,411 families are going to lose their rental assistance if nothing is done due to mismanagement of the VRAP funds. And that's something that we need to address right now so that people have shelter this winter. Mr. Scott, uh, would this uh, program approach uh, work and would it work around the state? Well, we are uh, part of this pilot pro program uh, with the city of Burlington and uh, have actually funded uh, part of that. Uh, we'll see. It's a pilot program uh, and we'll see whether it works or not. I'm sure that there are going to be some struggles along the way and we'll learn from it. Um, as well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this program is ending. Uh, this was a pandemic emergency and we had 90,000 people unemployed at one point in time. Uh, the federal government came up with this program, uh, forwarded the money, and, uh, and we put people in hotels and motels at that point. But again, the pandemic emergency is over. Uh, COVID is still with us, but the pandemic emergency is over. Uh, people are back to work. We have less than 1,500 people on unemployment at this point in time. Uh, so it's time to move on. And, uh, and again, we are putting in place uh, a great deal of money, hundreds of millions of dollars for more permanent housing uh, to transition people from homelessness to permanent housing. Let me ask you about uh, the workforce uh, problem and the size of our labor force. Vermont is uh, welcoming in as many displaced refugees as we can. The legislature again renewed the program that pays people in other states to move here up to $7,500 uh, to try to expand our labor force and our tax base. Um, we're spending a lot more on workforce training to fill open jobs. What more can be done under uh, the next administration to counter the fact that we are an aging state having fewer kids than ever? Mr. Scott. Well, again, we saw this coming. I, again, the 631 that I mentioned earlier, that I mentioned six years ago, didn't get a lot of traction in the legislature at that point in time. Uh, we had a, a program in place uh, that we wanted to implement. Uh, they weren't interested at that point. Uh, they've come around. They've seen uh, what the workforce challenges are uh, because they're living it. Uh, it's across every single sector in Vermont at this point. The pandemic just exacerbated, uh, exacerbated the situation. Uh, this was with us again earlier, um, the six of the 631. And uh, we're going to have to work at this uh, in all different ways. But we have to make Vermont more affordable. We have to have housing for them to be here. And, and that means uh, workforce housing. We need uh, you know, economical housing for the workforce in order to attract more people into the state. Uh, because we have the jobs available. We just need the people, but we need the housing uh, for them to be, be uh, here as, uh, as residents. Ms. Siegel. You know, we can't solve the workforce problem unless we address both childcare and housing. And we have to address it now in this transitional step. Because at this moment, whether you're a Main Street business or a larger business, we're having trouble building our workforce. And at the moment, Main Street businesses are actually bearing the brunt of these changes because larger businesses are shedding workers and putting that weight on the workers, while the businesses on Main Street are doing the right thing, increasing wages, increasing benefits. And so we need to have paid family and medical leave, mandatory paid family and medical leave. We need to support benefits and we need to support our small businesses as they are making these important and necessary transitions. All right. And that leads us to our next question about childcare. The nonprofit group Let's Grow Kids says Vermont families now spend up to 30% of their household income on childcare, even with financial help. So is universally available childcare funded by additional tax revenue something you'd support? Ms. Eagle? I do support that. And at the minimum, I support committing to making sure that families are only paying 10% of their income towards childcare. In addition to that, we have to make sure that the workforce for childcare is able to get the education they need without the risk of not being able to pay their bills. And we have to support our small schools. Just this past year, I had the opportunity to help save a small school in Southern Vermont, near where I live, uh, and brought the community together and in two weeks had a turnaround in a school that was about to close. Right now, the most important thing is that our legislature allocated funds 
to be uh, to go to bon child care bonuses. And the way that, that fund, those funds are supposed to be administered is they are sp asking the child care centers to front the money and then for people to have to then um, be reimbursed. That isn't how small, small child care centers work. We all know that. And that only puts a higher burden on families and a higher burden on the child care workforce. Mr. Scott. Yeah, child care is very important uh, to us and something that we've been working on. After school programs, child care, cradle to career education. It's something that we've been working on since day one. Um, and so we've, uh, we've come up with different approaches. I don't believe we need to raise an, an additional tax. I think there's an existing revenue that could be used. Uh, for instance, uh, the Wayfair uh, decision, uh, the online sales uh, tax, uh, we had offered that to the legislature uh, as a way to pay for childcare. They turned us down. Uh, today, that would be $30 million a year if they had taken advantage of that. But we will look for other revenue sources, existing revenue sources, uh, to provide for relief. May I ask you about the tax burden? Vermont's a pretty high tax state, ranked 47th highest by the Tax Foundation. Only uh, Connecticut, Hawaii, and New York are ahead of us. Given the revenues that are now coming in, and the new report just came out today, will you tell Vermonters you'll hold the line on new taxes in the two years ahead? And should property taxes in our state be based entirely on one's income and ability to pay? Mr. Scott. Well, first of all, we have done that over the last six years. We've held the line on taxes and fees. Uh, because I keep saying there's existing resources that we can use if we're creative enough and we put, look into it enough. The knee-jerk reaction of the legislature is always seems to be we need to raise another tax. Had I not uh, taken some of the steps that I've taken over the last six years, we'd be paying hundreds of millions of dollars more in taxes every single year. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I want to, raising taxes is the last resort. Uh, I think there's enough existing uh, revenue uh, to satisfy our needs, but we need to, to distinguish between our wants and our needs. And we can't just have a knee-jerk reaction. Every time we have a, another issue that we want to fund, we just can't keep raising taxes because we're pricing ourselves out of, out of the market, so to speak. That's why it's so important that we make Vermont more affordable so we can attract more people into the state at this point. More taxpayers, not more taxes. Right. Should we move um, completely to an income-sensitized property tax? <clears throat> no, I don't believe we should move entirely to an income-based um, approach. And, and I think that we need to uh, spread that out. And uh, there are a lot of reasons why, and, uh, and the legislature is fully aware of that. All right. Ms. Siegel. Um, in 2018, when the governor said that he wanted to make sure that our property taxes stayed at a flat rate, we all know, in 2018 I said that in year three, four, and five, we would see our property taxes increase. We all know that that did happen. And then we have to, Vermonters need to know that when we don't raise any revenue, we leave federal dollars on the table because they require a match. And what we're doing is leaving money on the table that could be used for housing, that could be used for childcare. And we need to make sure we don't do that anymore. And then finally, if we change the way we pay for education, which is only 25% of our education is paid for by residential property tax, if we change that from a property tax to an income-based tax, a progressive income-based tax, then we will spread it across a larger swath of folks and we will make sure that we are actually lightening the burden for most Vermonters. Let's talk about the changing climate. What is your strategy for Vermont to reduce carbon emissions to meet the state's 2030 target? Ms. Siegel. We need to make sure that we're increasing our public transportation. I'm on the Public Transit Advisory Commission and I've had the opportunity to both see what we can do and what we are doing uh, in that area. We also need to make sure there are solutions like heat pumps, solar panels, and uh, and electric vehicles are making it to low and moderate income families because most of our families are made up of low and moderate income. Most of our people in Vermont are made up of low and moderate income families. And then we need to make sure that we are increasing the way that we can build uh, in-state <coughs> renewable energy 
because our Public Utilities Commission is currently stopping the build of in-state renewable energy. And finally, we need to support our small farms in transitioning to carbon sequestration and require our large farms to do the same. Because that th that's the work that needs to be done and our small farms need that support. Mr. Scott, the, the latest report that came out this summer says that the state's not on track to, to meet the requirements by 2030. So what is your strategy to, uh, to get back on track? Well, again, this isn't a flip of the switch. And, and I believe in the electrification of vehicles. That's about 40% uh, of our emissions. I, I believe that the other 30% is heating our homes. So that's the vast majority of uh, what we need to be focused on, and we are. But it's not as easy as saying we, we're going to hit that goal because we have an electrical grid uh, that has to be upgraded in order to do that, or we need to provide for microgrids with battery storage and so forth, which is going to take a lot of infrastructure to implement that. If we go to electric heat pumps in every uh, aspect uh, throughout Vermont, if we go to electric vehicles throughout, we're going to increase our need for electricity, which means we can't, we can't possibly drive all of that ourselves with renewables in Vermont. It's just not practical. Um, it just won't work. We're going to have to rely on outside sources to do that. Fortunately, we have Hydro-Quebec, that's been a great partner for us and uh, we'll continue to work with them. But this isn't as easy as just flipping a switch. Do you want to rebut to that, Ms. Siegel? Yeah, um, <coughs> unfortunately, Hydro-Quebec is not actually renewable energy and it also, it, it often um, displaces indigenous people and causes quite a lot of harm, in fact. And furthermore, when our contract runs out with Hydro-Quebec, we are gonna see our um, our rates here in Vermont, Vermonters are going to be paying more. And so by reducing or not fully building in-state renewable energy, we now no longer have control of our grid and we don't have control of our costs. And what we need to do is change that so that we can have control of both. Governor? Yep. Well, uh, again, um, Hydro-Quebec is renewable energy. It's hydro power from Quebec. So it is renewable. It's under our statute that's renewable. Um, and we just don't, uh, pragmatically, we cannot build out, unless we build a nuclear power plant, which we, many voted uh, to disband a number of years ago. That would give us uh, carbon-free uh, electricity, and maybe we should advocate for that. I want to follow up. Uh, do either one of you expect an influx of climate refugees from other places, people moving here? because of the fact that, you know, Vermont is a, is a good place to live? Well, I mean, we've already seen that, but I do want to say that in Tropical Storm Irene, um, what many of us saw, my, my son and I lost all of our belongings in Tropical Storm Irene. And so it's really important to understand that the effects of climate change most impact people of color, the BIPOC community, and people who are low income. And so if we don't make the transitions that we need to now, then we're causing harm to the most marginalized and most vulnerable Vermonters. Governor, do you, do you expect anyone to, to move from a Florida or California to move here to avoid uh, climate change where it's, it's impacting them maybe just a, a bit more? I think we will see uh, some movement, uh, but as soon as they see our tax structure, uh, they might have other thoughts. Let me uh, change the subject here. I, I want to ask you both about the incident in Randolph the other day uh, at the high school involving a transgender student whose presence in the locker room there touched off an ugly backlash on social media. Uh, we understand thousands of hateful messages have been directed at the student, the family, the school, crashing the website. Uh, the school canceled a meeting that was set for tonight because of fresh threats. You are both LGBTQ supporters, but what is the role of the governor going forward in a case like this? Mr. Scott. Well, again, uh, and during the press conference, I had said we need to tamp down the rhetoric. Uh, we need to treat each other with respect and civility. Uh, and this, is, this case is un, so unfortunate. And the student it's, and, uh, is, is taking the brunt of this unfairly and unjustly. So again, um, we need to <clears throat> make sure that we're treating each other with respect and civility. And, uh, and, and again, this is just an unfortunate incident that should never have happened. Ms. Siegel. This isn't just an unfortunate incident. A news uh, center here in Vermont misreported the news, which then Fox News, a Republican right-wing based station, picked up and then many elected leaders across the country started attacking a child. 
And because a news station here in Vermont decided that they were not going to get the story right, they allowed our children to be bullied. And one of the things that we have to do, I am a bisexual woman myself, I came out at the age of 42, and I can tell you that I do feel fear at, in the society that we live in right now. And it's coming from the Republican wing of the party, the right wing party, and it is aggressive, and it is unchanging, and we have to do more to make sure people are safe, especially our children. Beyond unfortunate, Mr. Scott, is there something you would like to say to those who cannot abide by having a transgender student in the locker room? Well, again, uh, we should have the freedom to be who we want to be. Uh, I think as a Republican, I believe in personal liberty, and this is no different. So I, I think you should uh, take a second look at this. Uh, make sure that you understand the situation and that uh, this is about freedom, personal freedom, being who you want to be, and uh, this one child should not be bearing the brunt of this, uh, this issue. Ms. Siegel, you get the last word. We are adults. We are adults. And there are children who are experiencing severe bullying. I want you to know, if you're that child or another one experiencing that same thing, that you are loved, that you belong here, and that if, when I am governor, I will make sure that we are doing what it takes to make it safe at your school. All right, switching gears now. Vermont's gun violence problem has earned a lot of attention this year. Burlington's gunfire incidents are at a record high. Homicide numbers have spiked, and we have a new task force that aims to focus all available law enforcement resources on this issue. So will that fix this, or what is the solution to keep people safe? Ms. Siegel? When we're talking about gun violence, um, one of the things that we need to do is we need to ban military-style assault rifles, people killers, which were used in a recent shooting in Burlington. We need to make sure that we fully close our Charleston loophole because 10 days is not enough. And we need to expand our waiting period to 48 hours because when we look at this, we know that 80% of gun deaths in our state are suicide and we need to give people the time they need to get the help they need. But what's important for Vermonters to understand is I spend all day in the car with someone who just came back from the National Guard, who's a hunter, and we have had this conversation a lot. And one of the things that has become clear is that we can make sure that our children get to recess and protect our Second Amendment rights. Mr. Scott. Well, again, it's an unfortunate situation that we see, uh, find ourselves in. Um, starting with um, the defunding of the police in, in uh, Burlington. I think that started uh, their issue. Uh, having said that, uh, we implemented a 10-point safety plan where we're working together amongst all uh, areas of uh, law enforcement throughout the state. Uh, we're also working with the, the U.S. Attorney uh, and others, the ATF, and uh, we are going to target uh, some of this. A lot of it, a lot of what we're seeing with the gun violence uh, has to do uh, with drug trafficking, illicit drug trafficking. So again, when we talk about uh, the drug issue in the state, uh, enforcement has to be a piece of this. It has to be an equal partner in this, and we have to cut off the supply and the distribution. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the uh, gun violence. So if elected over the next two years, what is next in terms of firearm safety and gun reform in our state? What would you uh, advocate for over the next two years? Mr. Scott, let's start with you. Well, again, we made some major strides uh, about uh, three or four years ago, um, and uh, we need to continue uh, to implement uh, those. The red flag laws aren't universally understood, uh, and we need to do a better job in uh, advocating for that and explaining what that means so that they can be put into use. Um, beyond that, I'm always willing to listen, but I think we've done a, a great deal. Um, again, when we had virtually no, uh, no gun regulations uh, to speak of, uh, we, uh, we took major strides. I took uh, a lot of heat uh, from many of my friends and neighbors and supporters, but, um, but I think it was the right thing to do. And uh, again, we just need to follow suit and make sure that we implement what we have in place and make sure that people understand what that means. Ms. Siegel, you, you mentioned a ban a moment ago. Uh, what would you do if you were elected governor as far as gun reform? 
Well, first of all, I just want to say that it's nobody is saying that people should not go after kingpins when we're talking about trafficking of drugs, but that's not who we ever get. We get the people who are being trafficked and people with substance use disorder. And that's really important for us to understand, and also those are the people being killed. And we need to have a ban on military-style assault rifles because they're people killers. And we need to make sure that we expand that 48 our waiting period, because again, it is, the, um, it is suicides that are 80% of the gun deaths in our state. And then we need to fully close that Charleston loophole, because 10 days is not enough. It's okay for people to have to wait, and what we have to do instead is make sure that our children are sure to make it to recess, and that our kids come home from school and get the support and help they need, rather than ending up dead in school. Mr. Scott, has the state done enough? Well, again, um, I don't believe uh, that these low-level uh, folks that are uh, facing uh, some of the addiction issues they're facing are the ones we are arresting. Uh, we are focusing on the kingpins, and we are making a difference right at this point in time. Uh, again, people shouldn't, those that have, have been involved in some of the uh, incidents uh, throughout Burlington, aren't low-level uh, drug uh, uh, addiction user or drug users. They are uh, those who are trafficking drugs. So people in Burlington shouldn't be afraid to walk down uh, in, onto Church Street and walk through the downtown as they are right now. I agree that's why we need gun reform, but also we are getting low-level dealers. And I think maybe you don't understand how trafficking works for the people that have substance use disorder. Those folks are threatened, they are beat up, and they are killed if they don't do that work because they owe people money because they have substance use disorder and cannot get the treatment We're that they need in our state. We're not arresting them. We're going you after the kingpins. Them. That's just not you true. Are that is not that true. That is true. That is not true. You are absolutely arresting them. Not true. And you are causing harm, and our children are dying as a result. That's not true. Perhaps it's time for a break. You're watching The Debate for Governor here on NBC5. We have much more ahead when we come back. Thank you. Well, just, just give them that tip. Yeah. I'm wired. I, I, I can't do it. <coughs> Hello, one, two, three. One, welcome back to the NBC5. Blah, blah, blah. Welcome back. We are well, asking hard. about yeah. all sorts of We're not professionals. Tonight. Yeah. Does that sound good? Yeah. We're not. And it's hard because it's like a weird setup. Also, I really can't see anything right now. So. <laughs> Be clear, I'm not looking at anyone because I can't see anything. One minute. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hopefully, I don't sound thin. Hello? Uh, you got to make me. You Welcome back to the NBC5 Vermont gubernatorial debate. You took the words from my mouth. <laughs> uh, we have the Republican governor of the state of Vermont, Phil Scott, and his Democratic challenger, Brenda Siegel, in our studio tonight. We're going to shift now from open topics uh, that are directed at both to direct questions for one of you. We may offer a rebuttal as needed. Let's start with you, Mr. Scott. Eric Trump 
said over the weekend that the Republican Party in America is no longer. It is now the Trump Party, he said. And in some ways, it's hard to argue. You're no Trumper. You voted for Joe Biden. What would it take for you to say, you know, enough? I'm going to leave the party and uh, the one that's controlled by MAGAs now and become an independent or something else. Well, again, uh, the party doesn't define me. Uh, I follow the lead of uh, people like John McCain, uh, Governor uh, Baker in Massachusetts, Governor Hogan in Maryland. Um, and I think we are independent and we are Republicans and there are a lot of us uh, like that uh, throughout the country. Um, maybe the Trump uh, organization has taken hold uh, for a short period of time, uh, but I think that will subside. I believe in the two-party system. I believe that we need a healthy, uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, had mentioned that, we need a healthy two-party system to make democracy work. And I believe that uh, those of us who are moderates, who are centrists, uh, need to stay in the party to change the party. And I believe, uh, again, that we can. Big tent, uh, we have different perspectives, but, uh, but again, I think the moderate centrists uh, actually will lead in the future. You don't think it's now the Trump party? I, I, would, I would acknowledge uh, that the, the Trump organization has taken hold over a brief period of time, uh, but they weren't in, in charge uh, four years before four years uh, ago. Uh, and I think four years from now, it'll be a different story. Right now to Ms. Siegel. If you win, give us a sense of who you want in your administration. Give us a name or two people you would appoint to your cabinet. What's really important um, if I become governor is that we have diverse leadership and that that leadership both includes people with lived experience as well as people who have relevant experience to that job. All too often, we see governors appoint their friends and people that they just um, like and that don't actually have the relevant experience to different positions. And what we need to see is a change in that type of leadership. I do have ideas for who, that, who I would like to appoint. I haven't asked them if they would be appointed and I don't want to put them in that position or on the hotspot tonight. Mr. Scott. When Ms. Siegel was sleeping outside in the cold on the State House steps for a month last winter, trying to pressure you into opening up more motel rooms for those without a home, uh, how did that weigh in on your thinking? Were you concerned about her well-being? Well, of course, I was concerned about her well-being, someone uh, there, but we made sure that uh, the Capitol Police were making, paying attention and uh, making sure that she was safe. Uh, having said that, her being on the State House steps, and I know she has said that she won uh, and uh, changed my position uh, in terms of uh, more funding, uh, just isn't the case. Uh, that had no, uh, no um, bearing on my decision whatsoever. I had said previous to that, before she started uh, sleeping on the State House steps, uh, that it all had to do with funding. And if the federal government, FEMA, was extended, the state of emergency was extended, that I would extend the funding as well. Uh, but that decision wasn't made uh, until um, much to the end of when um, she decided not to sleep on the State House steps any longer. Ms. Siegel, the governor mentioned you. I'll, I'll give you 15, 30 seconds to respond. Not only is it a matter of public record that the governor was not going to expand the program, but while there was still a federal reimbursement, he exited over a thousand people in July of 2021, one of whom died of an overdose in August later that year after being destabilized. What's really important though about this is that I was not the only one there. There was also someone with me who had been chronically homeless for six years. He's watching tonight, Josh Lisenby. And what the governor just told him is that his advocacy did not matter. That the fact that he sat there and did not have to be outside and was outside anyways, and protecting me and other Vermonters didn't have, um, didn't have an effect. And we know it did because it's a very strong matter of public record that can be gone over over and over again in report after report. Governor, did it have an effect on you? It did not have any effect on my decision. It was all about the FEMA funding. The FEMA funding was there. No, the FEMA funding was not there. It was they there. were ending the program. It was there. So all right. You're wrong. Uh, Ms. Siegel, I'd like to take you back to the defund police uh, question and ask you, what is your message to the police officers of this state tonight who did not take kindly to the politicians 
who supported uh, calls to defund law enforcement? And how, as governor, would you rebuild departments that now face unprecedented vacancies? I look to uh, police officers like Chief Norma Hardy and Brad who do, who is doing incredible work with community policing, that she's making strides in working with the NAACP with both retaining and attracting police officers. All across the country, we're having a hard time getting the police force that we need. And what we have to do is make sure that we're updating our both our policing that we're fully funding what po the work that police do and also funding the work that social workers do and the work that people with substance use disorder treatment that they do and making sure that our communities have the resources they need we can't solve this problem just by talking um, about how we increase policing in the state but we have to fund the work that they do and make sure that they have the safe and healthy um, workforce that they need all right, now we're going to go back to general questions for you both. Ms. Siegel has made her support for safe injection sites, harm reduction sites, which would be state-approved places where someone could go and be supervised as they use opioids. And some say that those sites would be used to reduce fatal overdoses. Given the 217 deaths that we've seen in Vermont the last year from opioids, with more than 90% of those involving fentanyl, is this an idea worth trying? Mr. Scott. Um, I don't think it's worth the sacrifice it would mean for the other programs uh, that we have in place. We only have a certain amount of money. Uh, we have, um, we have uh, prevention, we have uh, treatment, we have recovery, and we have enforcement. Those are the four legs of the stools that we need to focus on that we know work. Um, this experiment with a government injection site uh, it just doesn't make practical sense to me. Uh, maybe it would in uh, one major in Burlington, uh, but pr from a pragmatic standpoint, we can't afford to put them in every region of the state um, and then not be able to put money into prevention, which I think is important, into treatment or recovery or enforcement. It would have to come from somewhere. So I don't think it's worth uh, doing in the state um, because we're so rural. Ms. Siegel. In March of 2018, my nephew, Kaya Siegel, died of an overdose. And he was the son of my brother who died just over 20 years before him, also while using heroin. With 20 years between them, we could not find the supports that we needed in our state to help them survive. And they both suffered from severe bipolar and trauma. We are underfunding mental health services. We have to focus on harm reduction first, treatment and recovery on demand, including medically assisted treatment on demand, dual diagnosis support, and criminal justice reform. In terms of overdo overdose prevention sites, even if you use a Republican talking point like calling it government injection sites, it's still an overdose prevention site. And what it does is prevent our children from dying. There are roughly 845 people who have died in the last six years, and each of those people, had they been in an overdose prevention site at the time of their overdose, they would have overdosed, but they wouldn't have died. And we know that because no one has died. And so the lives that it would save in the areas that we would be able to do it would be worth saving. All right, moving to the next question. The governor of Vermont earns about $200,000 a year, and the Secretary of State $127 grand plus benefits. But lawmakers at the State House earn about $15,000 a year, and many Vermonters working each people could not even consider serving because the pay is so low. Would you be willing to double legislative pay to help diversify the General Assembly? Ms. Siegel. Absolutely, and I think that there's lots of folks across Vermont who don't have access to elected leadership. I'm one of those. Um, it went throughout my son's life. He, I'm a single mom, and uh, we, I wouldn't have been able to survive if I had taken that path. And so it's something that we need to do for our legislators. Right now, there are more and more younger and more and more diverse legislators coming in, and we want to make sure that this is a path for them so that we, so that we can have the leadership we need, because it's not healthy or good for Vermont if all of our leaders are retired and have the resources to not know exactly what it takes to survive in our state right now. Mr. Scott. I'd be willing to um, give more money to legislators if we reduce the length of the session, uh, give them a certain period of time. 90 days would be plenty. 
Um, other states do the same thing. Uh, some states even meet every other year. There's no need uh, for us to have this extended uh, legislative session. I serve there, I know. So um, more money, uh, less time there, and I think it solves the problem. Can I? Ms. I'd love to respond. Um, so I advocate in the legislature. It is hard to get done all the work that needs to be done, and they are doing it in the time frame that it takes to do it, and in fact, often get short on really, get cut short on really important needs. I think what we've seen in the last six years is a governor that takes unilateral action in between the legislative sessions, and so I don't think it's actually useful for us to shorten those sessions and create more opportunity for a governor to take unilateral action when they should be collaborating with the legislature. Mr. Scott. I actually serve there. I understand uh, the system. Uh, I believe fully uh, that we, and I advocated for this while I was in the, in the legislature, uh, that we could reduce the length of the session. We could attract more people to get involved, and we could pay them more money. Um, so I think, again, problem solved. Let me ask you about health insurance uh, for the new year. Uh, <laughs> We're going to see a spike uh, in premiums come January uh, by double digits for many, many Vermonters. Our hospitals say they're facing much higher costs for uh, labor, for medical staff, for equipment, for prescription drugs. Um, do you think we're at a breaking point now in 2022? What do you advise Vermonters who cannot afford care? Mr. Scott? Yeah, again, inflation has taken over. Um, this workforce challenge that we face and is what we're facing across the country but certainly is worse, much worse in Vermont, uh, based on what we talked about before. So um, it's, no, it's no surprise uh, that we're in this situation. Uh, supply chain issues have, have uh, increased uh, the costs of, uh, of all materials, whether because they still have to heat the hospitals, they have to, to, to maintain uh, the hospitals, uh, as well as pay staff. Uh, and as well, when, when we don't have the staff, uh, that we have to go to uh, traveling nurses. And some of those traveling nurses are getting between two and $300. They themselves might not be getting it, but uh, the companies they work for do. So this has increased the cost dramatically in our hospitals throughout the state. Ms. Siegel. So we need to pass universal primary care and that needs to include dental, hearing, and vision and mental health as well. It's really important for us to do this work uh, because Vermonters do deserve to have health care. And I think it's important to realize that we are spending 6.8, Vermonters spend $6.8 billion on health care right now. And in fact, to increase access to primary care and health care in general would lower our cost and put more money in Vermonters' pockets. We also have to build coalitions with the states around us to really move towards having more resources and more support to have a single-payer health care system. We're a small state, that's hard to do on our own, but if we build a coalition with many states around us, a coalition I've already begun to build, then we can have health care that we all need. I want to rebut that, Mr. Scott? I know all the governors uh, throughout the Northeast and New England. I can't think of a single one that would advocate for some sort of a, a group to get together for a single payer system. We, we saw what happened, how much it was going to cost. Governor Shumlin strung it out for four years and then uh, we determined that it was too much money. Vermont couldn't afford it. I don't believe Connecticut or Massachusetts wants to pay for health care for Vermonters. Last word. I think that in this country, in America, we really believe in building together and making sure that we all have safe, healthy, and thriving lives. I've had some of these conversations, and I know that we all want to see the people in our states have the health care that they need. It's exceptionally important that we do this work. And furthermore, when we're looking at this, we have to remember that we are paying $6.8 billion, Vermonters are. We want, Vermonters want more money in their pockets. That's what they want, and that's what this will do. Let's talk about something that has pretty much dominated everyone's life over the last several years. We want to talk about COVID-19. What lesson have you learned from the experience managing the arrival of coronavirus that will guide your strategy should we suffer a resurgence of COVID-19, perhaps a more serious variant or some other health threat in the year ahead? Ms. Siegel, let's start with you. Uh, well, 
Uh, you know, I was, uh, had a child at home who was graduating in 2020, who was from high school, was sent home. Uh, and uh, we experienced quite a lot of struggle around that time, uh, including losing uh, work for me and him. Uh, and may, it was very, it was a big challenge. It was a challenging time for us. But most importantly, what we saw was Vermonters come together. And right now, we are the only state that is red. So we're the only state with high levels across the entire country. And why did that happen? Because we didn't better plan and we don't have the data going out. So Vermonters aren't able to make decisions day to day that support what they need to do to make sure they don't get COVID. And so the first thing we would do is make sure we increase testing and we have that data available regularly to Vermonters so that we can make sure our hospitals can plan, our schools can plan, and our families can plan. Uh, Mr. Scott, uh, 73 people in the hospital right now in the state of Vermont, nine of them in the ICU. Uh, what guides your strategy uh, as far as COVID-19? Well, point? again, we're watching uh, the hospitalizations. Uh, what we're finding, though, is 30% uh, of those uh, in the hospital uh, are with COVID. Uh, those who have identified as having COVID are in because of COVID. The other just happened to find out they had COVID once they were there. Um, so we are, continue to monitor that. We've been monitoring since day one, uh, hospitalizations, ICU, uh, the capacity and so forth. Uh, but we are not anywhere near uh, where we were once before. Uh, what I did learn uh, throughout the pandemic uh, was that we have to have a national strategy. Uh, we have to be better prepared in the future. Uh, we have to have a supply chain. Uh, we, we need to figure out how to take care of ourselves as a country rather than rely on China for some of the supplies that were, were necessary uh, during that time. We shouldn't be competing against other states uh, to get some of the gear and inventory we need. Uh, we, should be, we should be manufacturing that ourselves here. And, uh, and, and as well, uh, whether it's feeding ourselves or supply chain uh, gear and so forth, um, that's something that we need to, to work on as a country. All right, well, it's that time now for the lightning round, so think fast. One sentence, one sentence only, please. Mr. Scott, whatever your policy differences, would you say your opponent is qualified for the job? I would say she could become qualified, uh, but it would take a while. I Ms. think you need the experience. Ms. Siegel. Yes, I'm qualified for the job. I've is Mr. Scott qualified? I. I don't think this is about qualification. This is about whether or not we're moving Vermont, Vermonters forward and we're right. right now. Ms. Siegel, what is the worst part of campaigning? Uh, hmm. You know, I, I really like meeting Vermonters. Let me think. All Sorry. right, Mr. Scott. <laughs> Fundraising. Fundraising. Uh, Mr. Scott, what is the fastest you have ever driven a vehicle on a public road? <laughs> no comment. Oh, come on. <laughs> Ms. Siegel. 75. Truth? <laughs> I, 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 I think so. It's uh, been a long time that I've been a mom. <laughs> wanna, how fast, Mr. Scott? I didn't say. I no, you did didn't. Comment. <laughs> will, you, will you sign a law allowing sports betting in Vermont next year? Ms. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Scott? Absolutely. Mr. Scott, when did you last fire a weapon? Um, this past summer. Ms. Siegel? I have not. Never? Never. Ms. Siegel, what is your preferred adult beverage? You know, I don't really like to drink, believe it or not. So uh, my preferred adult beverage is a Shirley Temple. <laughs> Mr. Scott. Uh, Jim Beam and Coke. And when you get home for, after a long day and want to cook dinner, what is your best dish, Mr. Scott? Pizza. You cook your own I do. pizza? Ms. Siegel. Steak every time. <laughs> Are you confident you're going to win, Ms. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Scott. Never. Never. Thank you. All right, moving on now to closing statements. Ms. Siegel, you're first. In the last six years, the things that matter most to Vermonters have not gotten better, they've gotten worse. Vermont has not become more affordable, it's become less. The housing crisis has been barreling at us and there still is no plan. We have seen the most overdose deaths in the history of the state, and the governor is vetoing the bills. 
We have a climate crisis that's exploding and a public utilities commission that's preventing progress. What I know is that there are solutions to the problems we face. That together, we can have safe and strong communities. We don't have to throw our hands up anymore. This is going to be a tough fight, but it's not even close to the toughest fight I've had to face in my life, and I am still standing. And I know that there are Vermonters all across this state who have to get up and fight anyways, even though it's hard. And I'm inviting all of you to join me and your neighbors and community members to build a brighter future for the, our children and the Vermont that we all love so much. Because our children are watching and they need to know that we're ready for this moment. I'm Brenda Siegel and I would be proud to serve as your next governor. Mr. Scott. We've been through a lot uh, together over the last couple of years. You understand how uh, my leadership style, uh, you understand uh, the, the tough decisions you have to make, um, but we continue to make them. Uh, the vetoes were mentioned. Um, I know that uh, a lot of attention is given to uh, some of the disagreements I have with the legislature, uh, but you didn't elect me to be a rubber stamp for the legislature, the supermajority in the legislature. You elected me uh, to make the tough decisions based on facts. And that's what I've done over the last uh, six years and will continue to do if you reelect me as governor. It's about team building. You know, I get a lot of accolades for uh, what I've done either on the racetrack or in business or leading the state, but it really is about the team. Uh, the people uh, I put uh, around me, uh, surround myself with. And um, so you not only get me, but you get a very talented team to continue to move from up forward. And we have a lot of opportunity in front of us. We just have to make sure that we position ourselves right and that we invest rather than spend the ARPA money. We want to thank the both of you for being here tonight. And we want to thank you for watching our primetime coverage of this debate for Vermont governor. Remember, election day is Tuesday, November 8th. And you probably already have that ballot at home, maybe sitting on the kitchen counter at this point. For more information on how to vote and who the candidates are, you can visit our website. You can also watch tonight's debate again on mynbc5.com. So for Alice, Stewart, and all of us here at NBC5, I'm Brian Colloran. Have a good night.